next, um, we have our presentation for tonight. And our presenters, as I mentioned, are Zach Cohen, NP, uh, N6PK, uh, as well as Stu Sheldon, AG6AG. And they're going to review and discuss uh, the development and utilization of digital modes, FT4, FT8, and FT65. So Zach and Stu, it's all yours. And uh, you can share your screens when needed. Uh, but you'll need to unmute your mic so we can hear you. Okay, can you all hear me? We can. Why? There we go. Okay, hold on. That's, that's better. At least we're not have, having to look at you. Well, okay, can everyone see that? Yes. <laughs> that's right, everyone's muted. That's wonderful. But I can see it, so everyone else can as well. Okay, let me get rid of everyone else so I can see it myself. Okay, everybody. Um, I was thinking of all the different uh, uh, things we can talk about with FT8, FT16, RTTY, and all that. And then I came up with an idea that uh, there's been a lot of newbies around since field day. A lot of people are... Uh, a uh, lot of what are people are new to the field and may not know all the digital information. And there's a lot of old timers that are around and uh, they might have uh, learned the wrong thing when they started out. So what I decided to do was to give a little background on digital communications, followed by Stu who will be giving the lab showing how some of this stuff works. If you can hold on with your questions till the end, that'll help. Now in data communications, there's a lot of things that people disagree on. The formats, the protocols and the names. So we'll have to be a little bit loose on this and I'll explain that when we get to that point. So let's start. Starting out with a couple of slides on the advantages of digital communications. Less bandwidth and voice on most protocols. You all know voice is about 3.5K. Some of the digital uh, programs are uh, maybe 15 Hertz. We can put a lot of different digital um, protocols onto one bandwidth that would be normally used for voice. So it's a lot more effective, a lot less distortion. It's easier to design for various stages. Some of the digital we can even put on a Raspberry Pi. It's that easy to design because a lot of this is just on and off, ones and zeros. And in that case, it's more reliable. Usually it's low power, five to 30 watts is sufficient. We can use more, but that's a good start. There's many modes we're gonna be talking about. We'll talk about PSK31, we'll talk about RTTY. Which one do you want to choose? Which one do you want to use? There is no protocol that's the best. It's all based on what you want to do. Some people love CW and they'll do CW before they do anything else, before they do uh, a voice, before they do digital. Other people like uh, single sideband, they like the voice. Some people like FT8, I'm one of them. And uh, we'd rather do that than anything else. So there's no mode that's better than the others. The mode that you like, the mode that you want to do is the one that's the best for you. Some of these uh, protocols work very well under poor conditions. You've heard people say that, oh, I can't hear anyone on 20 meters, but they can sure get through on FT8. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. And Digital communications is fantastic for emergency communications. We want to use that for lists. If you are uh, working in EOC during an emergency and they want a list of everyone that was brought to the hospital, if you had to do 30 names and do it phonetically, that could be a mess. So we can use the digital communications to send out lists. And on the WinLink, on Packet, and any of the other digital communication modes which we'll get to. One last one, advantages of digital communications. Performance cannot be, uh, we can get better performance than that using voice and even CW because of the re reduced bandwidth. 
with some of the reduced bandwidth is so small, we can get that through no matter what. If we need the whole bandwidth for voice and we're losing some of that bandwidth, maybe we won't understand what they're talking about. For example, some like PSK31 uses small little channels with 30 Hertz signals, can put a lot of them, big advantage. Improved signal noise uh, performance. We can receive people on FT8 that's minus 16, minus 18 dB below, uh, below our voice. It's so Im important we can uh, receive a lot of that in good information. And some modes also have built-in error correction. That's just a couple of things that's uh, positive about digital communications. Just so we're on the same plane. We all wanna know what's, uh, uh, what, what it's used for. Equipment. Of course, the source of that is your computer. That's your digital device. Can have an internal or external, external sound card. If we have an external sound card, we have that. It provides sound from the computer software and sent to the transceiver. The transceiver is the transmission device, which can have software programs which control, like rig control. We set up the frequencies and set up other, other uh, programs that we could use with digital communications. Just a quick, just a quick uh, look at look at that. And let's. Oops, what happened here? And there's a signal link, and uh, that gives a sound card, and there's some other type of a transceiver equipment. You've all seen this before. The sound card, the signal link costs a certain amount of money, but you can go cheap and have a USB auto codec from Geeks, $5. You can also get free software, sound modem, that could use as a sound card. So whatever your needs are and whatever you can afford, it's available. So it's so easy to get onto the digital modes. Let's talk some of the technology and the terms. There's modulation techniques. That's how we analog, uh, vary the analog carrier frequency to carry digital information. Everything that we use according to physics uses an analog carrier. We send it out, it's a sine wave at a certain frequency. We can't send out digital because it's ones and zeros. And if we sent that out on our antenna, it would fall off the side of the antenna, fall to the ground into the bit bucket and it won't transmit. So we have to use an analog carrier frequency and modulate it. The easiest way is with CW where we just turn the carrier frequency on and off. Then we have the protocols. The protocols are how we put the signal together and each device in the circuit uses the same pro protocol. And when we do that, we can get information from A to Z, from one side to the other. If they're using different protocols, some of the equipment, some of the network, some of the uh, won't be able to uh, understand what's going on and it won't, we won't be able to get through. So we typically wanna use the same protocols. And then we have the software, which is a set of instructions or programs we use to operate the computers to complete the task. We'll go over that in the, in a couple of seconds. Well, let's talk a little bit about the modulation techniques. There are four ones I wanna mention. Now, here's an interesting thing. I've known many engineers that argue over every one of these. If we talk about protocols, they'll say, no, it's FSK, no, it's AFSK, no, it's PSK and all that. If you have five hams, you'll get 10 different ideas on what each protocol is. So take a little bit with a grain of salt and what we can do later on, if we can all meet together, we can discuss the philosophy over this in a, at a bar with a beer. But in the meantime, let's look at this as a general concept. And the general concept, the first one we wanna do is amplitude shift keying. And we send out information by varying the amplitude of a carrier wave. For example, if we wanna send a digital signal we can take a carrier, whatever frequency we want. And if we take that carrier and we use zero amplitude, it's turned off, that could equal a zero. If we go up three volts, that could equal a one. By sending zero and three volts, varying it, we can send out our ones and zeros. And that's how we can send out digital data over an analog carrier or frequency shift keying. The digital data is represented by discrete frequency changes. 
In other words, we can have this carrier frequency and inside the carrier frequency, we can vary frequencies such as saying uh, 1200 is a zero, 1200 Hertz is a zero on that carrier frequency. 2200 is a one. As we send these two different frequencies, we're sending zeros and ones over an analog carrier. Or we can do phase shift. That's an, another one. Uh, we have a sine wave. You remember the carriers, each one is a sine wave. Those zero, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, 360 degrees. Those are the various uh, phases of a, of a sine wave. So let's say we're sending out a sine wave, the continuous one. But if we say that we send out that sine wave and we don't change the phase, it's a zero. But let's say we're sending out a sine wave and it goes on the 90, goes to 180. Now, instead of continuing on the 180, we just say through using various components, we change the phase to go back up to the 90 position. So in other words, we go down, instead of continuing going down, we go up. So we've changed the phase. If we change the phase, it's a one. So if we keep the same phase, it's a zero. If we change the phase, it's a one. So we can send our zeros and ones by changing the phase. By using multiple phases like 45 degrees, 90 degrees and all that, we can send more bits per baud. More bits can be sent with in the area of one discrete signal representation. When we do more of that, we call it MRE encoding. We send more than one bits on a single signal. So that gives us a basic idea of the modulation techniques. So you know what we're talking about when we say it's ASK, FSK, PSK. ASK, on off king is Morse code. And as I mentioned about the voltage level, that's how RTTY works inside in the hardware levels, not outside on the air, then we change the frequencies. And we can, as, as mentioned, we can use shift keying to add bits. So in other words, we can, by changing a phase, uh, ch uh, changing the phase or changing uh, uh, the amplitude, we can also add an extra bit to it. And because it is amplitude, it's sensitive to atmospheric noise and propagation conditions. It's physics. If we have AM, we get noise. Frequency shift came. Digital information is transmitted through discrete frequency changes. If we call it FSK, we modulate, we change the frequency at the RF level, at the RF frequency. If we call it audio F AFSK or AFSK, we change the frequency at the baseband or where the signal is originating. Or we can have multiple frequency signal. In other words, we have more than one frequency being sent on that carrier. We can go anywhere from two to 64 different tones. Wow, it's a lot of tones. And that's the multi-frequency shift king, the two to 64. You can use concurrent or sequential tones. Because the tones are being sent and you gotta be accurate to know what the tones are, it requires accurate tuning. Because if you're off, you won't be able to decode it at all. Some of the multi-frequency shift came, we start out with Piccolo. That was one of the original MFSKs, 1962. Wow, that's before I was born. Well, maybe not, maybe not. Then we have the dial tone multi-frequency, which AT&T used. Remember when we had the rotary phono and then we went to touch tone? That's what touch tone is. We send out two tones and the two tones tell if it's a zero, which for the operator or one through nine. That's shift key, frequency shift keying. Then there's other ones, FSK 8, 16, Olivia, which I call Oliver because my grandkids call it Oliver and a whole bunch of others. And we have JT 65 and all of that. By the way, I'm gonna cover a lot of things in this presentation and some of the things I won't, but this will be on the CVARC website. So the things I don't cover, because we want to get through quick enough to get everything covered, will be on there. So you can look at it at your leisure and you can even ask me questions about it over email. Phase shift king, when digital information is transmitted through discrete phase changes. Remember I mentioned the zero and the 180. 
sometimes they're called binary, which is like two bit, two changes of phase, which is PSK, relatively low bandwidth because we're only looking at two little frequencies. We use low power because we can't overdrive it. And there is a variant called QPSK, which allows us to have more bits per second, a phase shift keying. Okay, so that's basically the modulation techniques. Now we use those modulation techniques via various protocols. Some of the protocols are RTTY, radio teletype, which started out originally from teletype, which is over, over cables. And then we were able to go on the line. And I'll cover that in a second. AX.25, X.25 was the first packet protocol. This was even before TCP IP, before the internet. It was the first one in 1975. For those of you that were around then, the ITU came out with this and they, they came out with all of the uh, uh, protocols and they put it out in various books, 20 books with all these protocols. They had the red books because they had red covers and they changed it to the yellow books, then the blue books. All of these came out and every four years they changed all the protocols. So all of our packet protocols are based on X.25, but we call that amateur X.25 or AX.25. PSK31, PSK63, I'll talk about that in a moment, along with JT65 and 9. And of course, FT8 and FT4. And for those of you that really want to have a lot of fun, Hellschreiber is a fantastic protocol to read up on. We can talk about that at a later date. So let's go in and talk about the software along with the protocols. There's a couple of software, a uh, couple of software programs that we want to talk about. First one I want to mention is Outpost. Now Outpost is what we use for emergency communications. We don't really use that in the ham radio world for sending messages other than emergency communications but I'm kind of partial to emergency communications, so I included it. It's my presentation and I did. So Outpost is used. RMS Express is used for WinLink. More of that's being used right now. We're going more into WinLink, RMS Express. FL Digi is what we're gonna show in the lab today. And it's used for various applications. And of course, WSJT, we use for weak signal software for FT8. FG and JT65, and we'll talk about that in one moment. So let's talk about radio teletype. Mode AFSK, the protocol is RTTY and the software is FLDG. Now, some of these protocols and some of the software kind of merge. Sometimes they merge with AFSK, sometimes it's not, but take this with a grain of salt and we can argue at a, at a later date. 1922, radio teletype came out. Inside the equipment, plus five volts is a logical one, also called a mark, because we used to mark a, a piece of yellow uh, tape, or minus five volts is a logic zero space, so there was no mark. So by looking to see if that tape had a mark or space, we knew if it was a zero or one. The output of the equipment was plus 80 volts was a logical zero, minus 80 volts was a logical one. That was the line levels before it went out on the air. This is right outside your equipment. If any of you ever worked for the telephone company and we use a lot of teletype and telephone phone company, it, it was all attached to frames in the main, uh, in the central office. And you touch a couple of the frame lugs. You got 160 volts across your fingers. That kind of hurt. And a lot of old timers probably remember that. The idle is a mark. Uses a five bit Bordeaux code, all uppercase because we yelled a lot. No one ever, no one ever uh, uh, spoke lowercase then. And you couldn't backspace to correct it. It just went out, it went out. When we go over the air, now we change it to tones. 2295 and 2125 is for a zero and a one. And it's slow speed, 45 baud, very slow speed. A lot of people love it. It's a lot of fun to use. And we have a lot of contests, RTTY contests. So something you can think about. 
let's go into mode AFSK, the protocol, AX.25, and the software uses Outpost. AX.25 is also used for Pactor and Winmore, which is also what we use in emergency communications to send information. For those old timers, and a lot of you want to have a little bit of uh, uh, knowledge about what happened way back when, it used an old Bell 202 modem protocol for X.25, which also used for APRS in 1980. 1200 bits per second, 1200 hertz for Mark, a one, and 2200 hertz for space. And we use Outpost all the time and all of our EO EOCs to do our packet network. Amtour, I'm not going to cover, but it's on here. Go look at your leisure. And it is amateur telex over radio. By the way, the interesting thing is telex, which was a very old digital protocol, was about 30 bits per second. And it is the only legal uh, protocol that we have in data communications. In other words, if you had a telex message, you could bring that to a court of law and that would be accepted as a legal document. Anything else, you had to have notarized or whatever. But telex is the only legal, little bit of trivia there, legal uh, uh, way of sending information. A five bit code, seven bits. And look at this at your leisure. We could talk about this at another time, along with Pactor. The software for that is Airmail, also has is Packet. So we can talk at that at a later time, because I want to get around to PSK31. Its mode is PSK, makes sense. Software is FL Digi, and we'll be showing this in the lab. The data rate is a 31 bits per second. So slow, it's, it's close to typing rate, depending on how fast you can type. So it could be in real time, and you could talk to people on it. You can type out and talk to people, as opposed to FT8 and all that with has canned macros that you use. It's low power, very narrow bandwidth, uses Vericode. Vericode is based on the same type technology as Morse code. There's a lot of E's in Morse code, so E was made into one dot, a lot of T's, one dash. If you had something like Z it was dash, dash, dot, dot. We use it less often so we can have more, if it takes up a little bit more time, that's okay. And that's what Vericode does. And it does need a sound card. And we'll talk about this during the lab. JT65, software is WSJT-X and it's FSK. It was designed originally for moon bounce, 180 Hertz bandwidth, very small. It limits 13 characters per conversation over 50 seconds. So one person sends for one minute and the next person sends for one minute. You get a chance to run out and get a cup of coffee and come back. It is wonderful. It is a wonderful type technology. And it was uh, slightly upgraded into JT9. JT9 was designed for LF, MF, and HF bands. Extremely weak signal conditions. WSJT, weak signal conditions. Very nine, nine frequency, frequency shift king. It's only 16 hertz bandwidth. The QSO lasts five to six minutes to transmit. And again, you can't reg chew on that. MT63 on FL Digi. Uh, look at this. This is some of the stuff we use in emergency communications when we set up our FL Digi for, uh, for emergency communications for our end beams. So look at this at your leisure. Any questions about this? Uh, we can talk about this offline. Same thing with Domino. It's another type of protocol and we can talk about this offline. I want us to get to the lab and you can see some of this in action, such as FT4, six second sequences, six seconds, four tone frequency shift, only 23.4 bars, so we can put a lot of signals over the bandwidth. It's designed for 50% probability, so you can be able to receive things at a minus 16 and still receive it, minus 16 dB, but a lot of people get through minus 18, minus 20. We can ask some of our FT4 FT8 heroes, and they can tell us how far they've gotten on it. Can work with signals 10 dB weaker than a radio teletype. And FT8, that's the one that uh, people are using, eight frequency shift, 
tones at 6.25 hertz, signal occupies 50 hertz. The transmitter receives signals are very quick. It's four times faster and it works well with moon bounds where Doppler shift would be a problem. So we've talked about a lot of the, just to give you a basic idea. I didn't want to go through this as a whole class. I just want to give you a basic idea, but I do want to cover one more thing. I do want to cover wind link because that's coming up more and more often. It covers many different areas because there's four paths the user can use connect to the wind link system, which allows us to connect amateur radio to the internet. One way is over HF radio. We talked about the Vera. We're able to uh, access through HF radio. We access uh, the ability to go onto the internet from the HF radio. We come to a, mo a node which allows us to get on there or through VHF UHF. Rob W6RH has a, has a node at his location and we can go on two meters and be able to get onto Winlink through his node and through some others. We could also tell net directly over the internet. So we can't say which is the type of modulation techniques because there's a lot of different techniques. So I, I wanted to just give a quick overall view on what the different protocols are, what the different modulation techniques, just so we're all talking about the same thing. I really would like you to hold all your questions to later but because we want to go into the lab. So going into the lab and 6PK to AG, 6AG, do you copy? Okay, so uh, for everybody that uses FT8, fantastic. I'm glad you guys, uh, I'm glad you guys enjoy that. Let me move this down out of the way here and one second. Let me pin this, all right. Okay. All right, there we go. So what I'm watching right here is I'm watching inbound signals. Um, and uh, they're all different colors. Now, I've got this set up only to look for CQs, okay? And if it doesn't have a color, if the color is white, I've already talked to them. So let me go a little bit here. Maybe, just maybe, I can make a connection, but let's see. I'm going to go ahead and jump on and pounce on somebody. Uh, you know, this is always the case. Whenever you go to do a demo, nothing frigging works. Uh, but I think I might have a, uh, oh, a, um, let us say, a stacked deck in the process here. Let's see. All right. So let's go ahead, since I don't seem to have anybody calling CQ over here on 40. Oh, there's one. Let's try him. So what I'm doing is I am attempting to connect to him. Do a little bit of adjustment here on my system. Get my antenna a little better in tune. There we go. Let's see if he heard me. Now, each one of these uh, exchanges is about 15 seconds. I'm going to send a code for 15 seconds, and uh, he is going to send a code back for uh, 15 seconds. And hopefully, we will be able to communicate that way. Let's see if he hears me this time. So let's talk a little bit about the screens I've got going here. Uh, up here, of course, I have the uh, uh, waterfall display. And, oh, hey, guess what? He's coming back to me. So it looks like I'm going to get a QSO. Let's see how this goes. I have the waterfall display up here that shows me the activity on the band. These uh, little notches up here at the top reference the transmit and receive frequency that I'm on. And then, of course, down on this box, this is where I have the communication. The left side is everything that's coming in, and the right side is up, and it looks like I completed, uh, completed my QSO with him. Let me go ahead and log it. It's just that simple. Um, the left side over here shows all of the CQs, and if I uncheck CQ only, 
I am going to see everything that comes in here. Um, and in under normal operations, it is quite difficult to uh, pick out CQs in uh, circumstances when they're all connecting at once. Uh, let's go ahead and demonstrate a uh, CQ. I'm going to go ahead and set up for CQ here. I'm going to tell it to hold my transmit frequency so my transmit frequency doesn't move around. I'm going to look around up here. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, select. Uh, let's go down here. All right. Nice little open area where I don't hear anybody transmitting. And I will go ahead and hit CQ and enable transmit. And I am now calling CQ. The cool part about FT8 is you can talk to just about anybody around the world on very low power. And you know what? We're starting to get some really good propagation out there now. So I'm truly looking forward to how the things are going to go in the future. Now, we'll see if anybody comes back to me. But uh, we're going to move away from this fairly quickly if somebody doesn't come back to me. And we're going to go ahead and try PSK31. Uh, we'll give it three CQs and see if anything happens. Now, of course, I can set this uh, uh, the colors up. Any up? Oh, oh, KD6NFD. Looks like I had somebody come back to me. And we'll go. Now, this is all automated, by the way. I'm not doing anything. When I was selecting my QSO, uh, when I jumped on the other uh, amateur operator that was calling CQ, all I had to do was double click on uh, his CQ over on the left side and immediately change my frequencies and made everything else work. So there I go. Look at that. All right. See, I'm just racking up the QSOs while I'm sitting here giving a demo. Now, um, once I get done, I'm going to open this up to questions, and uh, Zach and I will try to answer whatever questions we can. And what I'm waiting for here, by the way, is I'm waiting to make sure he returns a uh, 73 to me, acknowledging that it is now over. Oh, well, looks like I got somebody else calling me. Here I thought I could get away. All right, let's do one more. Now, for those of you that used to run JT65, that's how I got started with WSJTX, was running JT65. It would be one minute per half exchange. Oh, looks like I lost him. We'll give him one more chance to come back. Anyway, these exchanges on FT8 are really quick, and FT4 is twice as fast, by the way. Uh, you're only looking at seven and a half seconds uh, as a uh, uh, per side exchange. And only five seconds of that is actually transmit. Uh, looks like I lost him, so I'm going to go ahead and hold my transmit. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and move out of this. I'll close that up. And let's go ahead and pop open FL Digi here. And uh, let me move this out of the way so I can see what I'm doing. Sort of. There we go. All right. Now I'm going to go ahead and I need to change my frequency over to there and of course I should be on 14070 I should be off of split let me get that tuned in over here Oop, a little too far come back here come back here ah there we go let me get my uh, tuner semi set up to something close here uh, like I said nothing like doing live demos And there that is. All right. Let me go ahead. I'm going to put a tone on to make sure this is tuned right. 
and yeah, that looks pretty good. All right. All right. So basically, this line right here is where my frequency is centered on for PSK31, and that's what we're set up for. And I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to sit here right on 15, and I am going to call CQ. Let's see what happens. Now, if you're able to read this, I know it's really small, guys, but if you're able to read this, it certainly looks a lot like this other protocol called CW. Well, you look at that. Somebody's coming back to me. Ah, W6KME. There we go. All right. Let me uh, go ahead and uh, answer him. And now I get to type. And you know what? I'm going to go ahead and send him a little bit of information about me and give him a signal report and everything. And this is, again, all canned, right? It's a macro. But I could very much type this all in any way I wanted to uh, if I wanted to put it in manually. Um, and when this is all done, all I have to do is click the KN macro here. And I can say back to you, Keith, W6KME. There we go. And he should reply back to me. Well, howdy. I love it. He's going to tell me he doesn't have his QTH macro set up. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's all right. Um, anyway, back to me. All right. Now, from here, I can carry on a regular QSO, or I can send him more information with macros. Let's see. Thanks so much for helping me demo this. There we go. And, of course, I'll go ahead and uh, say, uh, great talking. And then I'll go ahead and end it. And you know, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, some of the cooler things about FL Digi, of course, is it handles all sorts of different digital protocols. I mean, um, it uh, handles uh, Hal Schreiber, it handles uh, PSK31, um, uh, 63, all of, uh, all of its uh, different attributes. Also QPSK, which is the PSK version with air correction. Um, RIDI, RIDI 45 baud, 50, 50 baud, 75 baud, uh, Thor, Throb, uh, and of course Olivia, all the protocols. Uh, and, of course, uh, MT63, if uh, I had FM on this rig, I could actually send an FL Digi message just like we send uh, during the uh, EOCs. Anyway, oh, and when I'm all done, of course, I can just sit here and click this to save the log uh, with Keith. But uh, for now, I'm not going to log him. It really was just a test. So let me drop that. And with that, I am going to go ahead and let me stop sharing my screen here. There we go. And uh, I'm going to, I guess, open it up for questions for everybody. It's much easier when you're asking questions than it is for me to guess. So any questions, come now. Dude, I got a question. This is Barry. Casey. Hey, Barry, how you doing? Pretty good. Hey, I noticed two things on FTA. One is when you re, you were responding to the CQ, you did not have your TX on hold. You jumped onto his frequency. Correct. I don't do that. Okay. Why do you do it? Depends. There's two arguments for that. 
Argument number one is that, you know, if you're on a frequency that's clear, why move to his frequency that he's using, right? You have a frequency that you, you know, you don't hear anybody else on, you're on it. Go ahead and transmit on it and just move your uh, receive over to his. It was Rob W6RH that brought up an excellent point to me regarding that, um, having to do with the fact that you have no idea what his receive waterfall looks like. And his receive waterfall, where I'm at, may be full of traffic, right? Local traffic that I'm trying to walk into. So, uh, but for a very long time, Barry, I did it just the way you're talking about. Uh, and he, he gave me a great argument. And I learned a long time ago, if somebody gives me a good idea, I should run with it. I'll give it a try. The, the second point is when you were, um, when you bought the uh, QSO, you did not wait for his 73. I normally don't log until both 73s are there. Well, so what I do is a little different. If he does not send me the 73, if he repeats his last, uh, uh, um, basically, RR73 or RR statement or whatever, I will resend the 73 or resend my RR, okay? Um, which, um, and I can always go back over to my log and delete it, you know? Um, it's really difficult when that thing's open. Sometimes it can pop behind a window. My log can pop, uh, log entry can pop behind a window. I'll forget it's there and all of a sudden I don't get logging requests anymore. So just for housekeeping on my screen, I do it that way. Okay, thank you. All right. Any other questions? Hi, Stu. Hey, Andy. How you doing? I'm doing good, man. How are you doing? So, I'm doing great. So the, 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 the great advantage of FT8 is there's hundreds, thousands of people out there. I think you were... Uh, uh, on a contest this last weekend or maybe the weekend before, the Riddy or okay, right? Both, how yeah. Find, <laughs> how do you find people? How do you say? Because the thing that I like about the these other, you know, just, uh, maybe a little too computer centric for me. I like I like the idea of you know sending a little bit of chat. But how do you find people? Are there thousands of people out there or, or no? So, you know, that is an excellent question, and it depends a lot on a couple different factors. Uh, one factor is obviously propagation, okay? Um, you know, if propagation is off that weekend or off when you're trying to do it, doesn't matter how many people are out there trying, you're probably not going to get a contact. Um, the second is, um, you know... Knowing how, uh, if, if you're on a contest, okay, a great example is a PSK31 contest. The nice part about that is they're all hovering right around uh, uh, 070, okay? You hear 070 a lot when we talk about PSK. Um, 070 is basically the um, kilohertz after like 14070 for 20 meters, 7070 for uh, 40 meters, it all ends in 070. The same way kind of with FT8, where it all ends in uh, 074, right? Or uh, the old uh, JT65, which all ended in 076. So that's fairly, uh, that's fairly simple. Almost everybody sits on that single frequency and is within one or two, uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say that, within three or four kilohertz on either side with PSK31. Now, Riddy, Riddy starts at 080, basically, and goes until you bump into uh, voice, okay? Uh, a lot of CW operators absolutely hate Riddy because they are all over the place, um, which is fun because, you know, you can talk to a lot of people. Um, Riddy is its own little nightmare. Uh, to get to learn. I didn't demo it tonight because it's difficult to demo 
Uh, I'm thinking about starting up actually a PSK slash RIDI kind of net that we might do every week or every other week just to give people some practice with it. But that's that's kind of secret voodoo. I haven't quite gotten all the plans together on that. That's a great idea. Is there a national calling frequency in, in, in different bands for RIDI? Uh, I, I don't know. I've never you used know, one. actually, RIDI is, like I said, usually 080. Okay, but it goes up from there, and I've seen it go down, way down in, uh, into what we call the realm of CW. On a big Riddy contest, they're all over the place. Uh, and if propagation is good, you're going you're gonna to get somebody. Now, the thing about Riddy is nobody's ever considered Riddy low power. Okay, Riddy is how much power do I have? There's people out there running RIDI at, uh, you know, uh, full license power, right? 1,500 watts. So, uh, okay. and... So, uh, so what I'm, I'm hearing from this, it's kind of like sideband phone, right? You, you go out there and you search, right? Which is great if there's lots of people out there. If there's not, it's, it's difficult. So, you know, I, I have a SDR dongle. Actually, I have more than an SDR dongle, but it, I started with an SDR dongle, and it just went from there. But that ties in with the receive antenna and all sorts of other things. So I have a full band waterfall display, and I can look at my waterfall, and I can say, that's ready, okay, that's digital, that's PSK. Oh, that's a big pile of uh, FT8. Over there, oh, God, look at all those CW operators. Must be a CW contest this weekend. So I have a little bit of an advantage with that because I can move into that frequency really quickly with a mouse click and see what's in there. And everything follows it, my FL Digi and everything else. So it makes it easier. But, yeah, it's all about just hunting and pecking the same you know concept. Got a question. Uh, well, question. Well, one, one, one second, Greg. Just before you go, Nathan had his hand up, I think. Go ahead and turn your audio on, Nathan. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, first was a, a statement. Uh, thanks, both you guys, for all the information. It's it's nice to have things like the internet that have a lot of info, but you also get it little bits and pieces. It's nice to see it in one spot. Uh, the other comment was, I found... Uh, um, reports of the FT8 demo you did on PSK Reporter, and I put the link in the chat, and it shows that you received a different place. So my, the question in there is, uh, what power were you transmitting at? Oh, I was transmitting at 5,000 watts. <laughs> no, no, no. I was uh, transmitting at 50 watts. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, Greg, go ahead. Yeah, that I was wondering if you could cover some of the pitfalls in FL Digi in regards to sound card setup, uh, because some of the menus can be somewhat confusing to individuals. So FL Digi has, what would you say, Greg, 100 different menu pages or something like that of stuff you can set up? Uh, what you're doing. Yeah, well, I'm a firm believer. The first thing that I learned about FL Digi, I figured out how to delete my entire setup and start from scratch if I screwed it up because it was really easy to screw up. Um, FL Digi is easy to set up if you know exactly what you want to set up. Okay. Uh, sound card settings actually are fairly easy. Uh, sometimes you run into issues where you need to invert the left and the right channel. God only knows why. Um, but you, the biggest problem I see people have with setting up digital isn't necessarily setting it up in a particular piece of software. It's figuring out what sound card they're actually using, right? Um, I've got, let's see, one, two, three, four, five... Five radios with sound cards built into them. They're all plugged in via USB. I actually had to add two USB cards to get uh, four four by USB cards to get everything that runs off USB in my shack plugged in. So I cringe every time I got to reboot because everything's going to move around. I, I you know I already know that. Actually. Pretty much it stays the same. I'm, I'm actually pleasantly surprised with Windows 10 about that. For the most part, things hang where they're supposed to hang. 
But you have to know which each one of those are identified as in your device manager. So when you go to set them up, you pick the right one, right? That's, that's the difficult part. Um, the part that I think everybody bangs their head up against the wall in a lot of cases is how do I get pushed to talk? How do I get my cat system working? How do I get my radio just to interface with the software? And there's no easy way to do that. I mean, it's just, okay, you got to know what you have, uh, you know, uh, your COM port set to. You need to know what your baud rate set up on the radio, how many stops and data bits you have. You have to make sure you understand that in my case, I've got two separate COM ports on each radio. One is a simple COM port that just looks for a, a, a um, RTS signal to key, right? And the other one's a full control CAT COM port. So you have to understand all that and play with it to make it work. And I take notes. If I get something to work, I write it down. But I also know that everything changes when I reboot the computer sometimes, so I deal with that. That wasn't a real good answer, was it, Greg? But it <laughs> Any other questions? Ah, well, I think we got it. Uh, any questions uh, for Zach? Okay. Well, so with that, um, Bob has a big magnifying glass there. I, I saw that. I'm not sure what he's doing with it. Are you inspecting my digital or what? <laughs> no, I just thought I just happened to have it, so I thought I'd hold it up and and everybody can draw their own conclusion. It's so. Nothing. You know what? It's it's nice that we brought attention to Bob because what you've been doing digital now for what about six months, right? Yeah. Yeah, and it was it was a bit of a steep learning curve, wasn't it, to get everything set up and working? It was. And but now you're an old pro, pretty much, right? And you've got I'm a comfort. Old. I'm, I'm old. <laughs> um, I had immense help from Adrian. I wish he was here, but. The, the poor soul has to go to a job, but uh, uh, Adrian physically came over and 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 he actually built the setup for me and and was kind of my backup person. No, the reason I had this magnifying glass here, where is it here, is that uh, Norm held up a piece of paper with some kind of writing or something on it. So I thought I'd I'd hold this up and try and read whatever he had there. I don't know what the... That's all my settings. That's what Stu was talking about when he helped me get mine set up. <laughs> You know, once you get it set up, and I think the most important thing, if you if you take anything away from this presentation, because this really, you know, both Zach and I discussed, this is a 30,000 foot overview, okay? We did not drill down into anything. I've got some videos on how to get uh, WSJTX set up and how to get FL Digi set up to do emergency communications. That stuff exists out there. Um, feel free to look at my um, uh, uh, YouTube page, and uh, you know uh, it's it's there to help. Um, but um, there is, you know, it's it's like the first time that you decide I'm going to make logging software talk to my radio, and you go through all those contusions. Literally, I, I had bruises all over my body for slamming my hand down on the desk because I had so much trouble getting the doggone thing to interface right with the radio and do what I wanted it to do. And even after I did that, then I had to figure out how to make sure that I could get all of the uh, frequency changes to work smoothly because the doggone thing messed with my frequency changes because I was, uh, uh, I had, uh, God, what was it? I think I had RT, uh, uh, RT, uh, RTC hire, or something like that on it. Anyway, long story short, once you figure it out, you'll never forget. But, Stu, can I ask you a, a question? Um, if you do not get a 73, you know, you do, you, you know, you hit the pop-up window and you want to throw it in your logbook. But if you don't get a 73, that is not a valid contact or it kind of is. Well, God, there's there's two schools of thought on that, and uh, the um, uh, the r inventor of the of the protocols that we're talking about, of the modes that we're talking about, 
you know, thou shalt send a 73. Um, but, um, you know, how many QSOs have you had with Japan, Robert, Bob? How, how many uh, on FT8? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe 25. Okay. And how many of those failed when they were trying to t connect to you, failed to give you their uh, 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 maidenhead grid? Probably 20. Yeah. Okay. So, And that's supposed to be part of the exchange. Right. So it's again, um, if both sides decide that it's a good idea to go ahead and turn it into logbook of the world, what's the worst that's going to happen? It's not going to get accepted as, as something that you can use for logbook of the world. Um, I'm a firm believer if someone continues to send me uh, a request, right? Um, you know, continues to send me his last exchange as if he did not hear my 73, I will continue to send the 73. Okay? I, will, I won't terminate my attention with him. I may have already put it in the logbook, but I certainly can take it back out. Okay? If I don't... Now, if I send my uh, RR73... And he doesn't send me a 73 back and he's off talking to somebody else. All right. Well, you know, he obviously didn't want to send me a 73. And I'll log it. That all makes sense? Yeah. But when it comes down to it, the person that's going to give you that award, right? The, the person that's going, if you're going for awards, like worked all states, you know, logbook of the world is going to make the determination. It has to be logged on both sides anyway. I have a comment on that. Yeah, Ron. Um, do any of you guys use a JT Alert? Um, I can show you a quick demo if that's okay. Um, Brett, that's up to you. It's your meeting, sir. Yeah. I just want to throw one little quick point here in terms of the configurations. You go through all the trouble to set up your, your uh, station. Be sure you do some print screens of your configurations and put it in a three-ring binder because... Our memories are too short. If something happens, then you're back, like Stu says, trying to refigure it all out again. It's best to print it out once you got it going. The only other thing that I'll recommend also is figure out where your data is stored for the program, okay? And back it up regularly, okay? Uh, if something goes critically wrong, you can always restore that back rather than going back from scratch. Anyway... Um, let real are are there any other questions for Zach or myself? Warren has a question. Warren, um, my comment was regarding your seven getting the seventy three. That's why I was bringing up JT Alert. Oh, no, I I understand. Let let's give give that a second here, and because I'm going to pass it back to Brett, and then Brett can show uh, let you show that. All right. Um, it, go ahead, Warren. I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. I, you know, you're in charge. Um, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I know we're in trouble. But, uh, <laughs> no, the, uh, obviously no one set of software covers all the modes. But between um, FL Digi and WSJTX, I think, are the two I hear a lot about. Is there a lot of overlap? Or are they are they pretty much separate things? I mean, if you want to, if somebody wants to start, and they don't know just which mode they're going to start with, is there one that they can do most of the modes with, and they kind of learn its configuration first? That is a that is an amazing question, Warren, and thank you so much for asking it. Um, WSJT65 strictly does JT65, JT9. FT8, FT4, and uh, there I think one other, um, which FL Digi does none of. But FL Digi does all the stuff that J uh, that WSJTX does not. So between those two programs, you cover just about everything, except for packet. Okay, which is, we, we haven't even talked about that, 
but there is a really fun digital pro digital mode that you can play with with just a technician license in an FM radio. Okay, um, you know so uh, and uh, the the new uh, a lot of the protocols that uh, Winlink uses they are what we call AFSK protocols. Okay, uh, and those protocols only work in Winlink, right? Uh, there's some cheating you can do with Vara. I've got a Vara chat client. I played with it, you know, but that's not nearly as fun as it is to play on packet and stuff like that. Uh, most of the protocols associated with um, Winlink, such as Vara uh, and uh, Pactor and Winmore, uh, are pretty much exclusive to the um, Winlink kind of ecosystem. That answer your question, Warren? Yeah, it, I bet, basically I think what it means is um, if you're gonna if you don't know what mode you want to start with, you're gonna plan on learning three sets of software: WSJTX. Um, uh, Anyway, the, the three. The... At the end of the at the end of the day, Warren, you're absolutely right. I started out with FL Digi because I wanted to do PSK31. That was before everybody went crazy with FT8. If you're new to digital and you want a low barrier to entry, start with FT8. That would be my advice. Um, but don't forget about RIDI and PSK31 and all these others because they are a lot of fun. And in my opinion, much more fun than FT8 because I can actually do keyboard to keyboard communications and have a conversation with somebody, not just an exchange that gets me an award. Okay, real good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right.